Hello, this is Matt from Matt in the Apps, and this is the seventh and final part in our full game tutorial series where I'll be teaching you how to make the full iPhone game seven sides in Xcode using SpriteKit and Swift. So far we have a playable game and today we just have to polish it all off. So in this video we will set up our main menu, we will set up our app icons and we will set up our launch screens. We will then wrap up the entire series by having a look at some of the ways that you can change this game to really make it your own. So let's jump back into Xcode and let's finish this project. So we now have a fully playable game. We have a game where you can score points, you can get a high score, the game will get more difficult as you go, you can get game over, and you can restart the game to play again. We have a fully playable game. So all that we have left to do now is take the game that we have and turn it from just a game into a game that's ready for the App Store. And for this, the first thing that we will do is we will set up a main menu. So in Seven Sides, the main menu looks like this. We will have a background, our logo, the game name, some instructions on how to play, and a button that you can push to move into the game scene to start the game. And when you first open up the game, you'll get taken into this scene rather than into the game scene. So for this, we will use another SKS file, a drag and drop scene builder. So we can very quickly make this scene rather than building a whole bunch of sprite nodes and label nodes through our code. So to build our main menu scene, this will be very similar to how we built our game over scene in the previous part. So we will absolutely smash through this. So as we will use an SKS file to build up our scene, we need two files. We need our actual SKS file to drag and drop objects onto our scene, and we need a Swift file for our code. So let's make these. So here in Xcode, we will go File, New, File. We want an iOS Sprite Kit Scene. Hit Next. And this will be our main menu scene. And hit Create. As you can see, we now have a main menu scene .sks. We need one more file for our code for this scene. So file, new file, this time an iOS Swift file. And once again, call this the main menu scene. This will give us a main menu scene.swift, a place for the code that we need for our main menu. We now have to link these two files together. And to do that, the first thing we have to do is jump into our main menu scene.swift and use this file to create a new SK scene. So in our main menu scene.swift, import sprite kit so we can use all of the cool stuff that we can do with sprite kit and set this up as an SK scene called main menu scene, just like so. So we have now taken this new file, this main menu scene.swift, and we have made a brand new sprite sprite kit scene and this will be linked up to our SKS file. To link these up we will push command B to build into our main menu scene.sks, zoom out if you have to to get the entire scene on display, click on the scene, over on the right fourth tab along custom class will be the main menu scene. Push enter and save. So we've now made two new files, our main menu scene.sks and our main menu scene.swift where we have built a new scene and we have now linked these together. Now as I explained in part 6 when we made our game over scene.sks, sometimes Xcode can throw up a bit of a bug where these two files aren't linked together and if that is the case for you there's a really small extra bit we have to do a little while later I'm sure you remember to fix it is nothing major, but that bug aside, our two new files are now linked together. So we can now move on to actually make our main menu scene. But before we do that, over here on the left, things are starting to get a little bit crowded. We now have five files for our scenes. We have our game scene built entirely through code, our main menu scene SKS and our main menu scene code, and our game over scene.sks and our code for our game over scene. So what we will do, we will find these five files, just click on the first one, hold command on the keyboard, select all five, right click, and we will do new group from selection. This will put these all into a folder and we will call this scenes. Keeps it all a little bit more organized. 
It's up to you how you organize these actual scenes together, but try and keep the two files for the main menu scene together and the two files for the game over scene together. I personally like to keep them in an order that we will work our way through them. So in our actual game, we will go from the main menu to the game scene to the game over scene, but that's just preference. Okay, so into our main menu scene.sks. The first thing we have to do is set this scene up so it's in the right size for our scaling down technique. So click on the scene over on the right third tab along and we will make this scene size the exact same size as the other two scenes. So our game scene is being built with a size of 1536 2048 and so is our game over scene. So our main menu scene will also have a width of 1536, height of 2048. Just a really quick note, if you're ever making your own game and you want to use this scaling down technique and you want the game to be in landscape, so on the phone side rather than upright, make sure to remember to swap these two numbers. Otherwise you'll get some bizarre results. Just a heads up. Let's zoom out again to get the entire scene, like so. Okay, so let's drag the bits on that we need for our main menu. So let's start with our background. We want a sprite node, so a color sprite. Making sure the object is selected. Over on the right, third tab along, the texture is gonna be our game background. Make sure that Z position is minus one, which is all to do with our layering. And let's drag this into position making sure the position of the background is zero, zero. We want our game logo, so another color sprite. This time the texture is gonna be game logo. Let's drag it to where we want it to be. Use the yellow line to make sure it's in the center of the screen going across. I'll have mine about three quarters of the way up. That looks good. So we now have our background and our game logo. And we now need our labels. So we need a label to show the game name. We need a few labels to explain how to play and a label that will say play, which when you tap, you will get taken into the game scene to start the game. So it will work as a button. However, to make it, it will still just be a label and we will use it as a button through our code. So everything else that we need will be a label node. So let's grab a label, drag it onto the scene. And this first one is going to be a label that says the game name. So seven sides. Before we do our font and our size, let's do our color so we can actually see it. So click on color and we will go down to other into our second tab, into our RGB with a red of 85, green of 85, blue of 85 to get the gray color that we're using. And then we want our font. So make sure the label is still selected. Find font, click on the T. We will use the font Caviar Dreams, the custom font that we set up in this series a few videos ago. Once again, full credits for this custom font in the video description. I think it's a really nice font, so thank you to the creator for that. And the font size will be 225, like so. And let's drag this label somewhere between our logo, like so. So our main menu now has our background, our logo, and it clearly shows what the game name is. We now need a play button. So another label, making sure the label is selected. The text will say play. Again, let's do our color so we can see it. RGB with a red, once again, 85, green 85, blue 85. When it comes to like font colors, try and be consistent unless there's a reason. Kind of having colors all over the place for your labels will look very, very amateurish. And that's obviously not the impression you want to be given off in your game. And the font, once again, Caviar Dreams. And let's set the font size. The thing I really like about the SKS files is that we can literally play around with this to get exactly as we want. So let's say we set this to 100. You know what, that's a lot too small. I want this label to be big. I want it to command attention. So let's go a little bit bigger. 200, maybe too big, 150. No, I think 200, I think 200. Let's drag this to where we want it to be. So we now just need a few more labels for the instructions for how to play our game. And something like instructions and just information about how to play. It's one of those things that is so easy to forget. You could argue a game like this, you can kind of figure out how to play as you're playing it. But if you don't have the instructions in the game, that first impression that someone's gonna have of your game is confusion rather than fun. And that, unless you're going for that effect, obviously isn't a good thing. So just a few labels to explain how to play can make a huge difference. 
it can almost be one of the differences between the gamer playing your game five times or ten times, maybe seeing a few adverts along the way, and playing it once and just turning it off and never going back to it. it can make all the difference. Now, I personally like to have my instructions somewhere really obvious. I personally never like to put them into a separate scene. It puts them really out of the way. I like having them somewhere obvious, bam, on the main menu or somewhere really obvious in the game. So we need a few labels. So let's drag on a label. And this first label is gonna say how to play, colon. We will give this our standard color. So hit color, hit other, red of 85, green of 85, blue of 85. And this label will have a size of about 65. Let's try 65. So it's quite small, it's out of the way, but it's there. Just as a quick audio edit, when I was recording, making the main menu scene, I forgot to use the custom font Caviar Dreams on the labels at the bottom of the scene explaining how to play the game. I knew something wasn't right somewhere on this main menu, but I completely overlooked setting up the font. So we sort of fix it in about 20 minutes, half hour-ish in the video, but for these labels at the bottom, make sure you remember to use Caviar Dreams and use a font size of 70 rather than what I do for this font here. The size for different fonts is slightly different. So use Caviar Dreams font size 70. Okay, now the other labels that will describe how to play will be the exact same color and the exact same size, just different text. So what we can do with our how to play label selected, hold Alt on the keyboard and just drag down another label. We can position these all in a minute. Make sure the new label is selected. And this second label is gonna say, tap to spin the color wheel. Sorry any fellow Brits, I'm spelling color the American way. We need another label. And this one is gonna say, make the ball hit the same color, like so. Okay, just like that. Again, feel free to change these. Do it in a way that you think makes the most sense. So try and keep it nice, short and snappy and make it as clear as possible. So let's line these up. We want these quite low on the scene. So this is now everything that we need for our main menu scene. So now feel free to play around with some of this stuff. And again, this is what I love about the SKS because we could see this being built. You know, earlier on, I thought this play button looked big enough. And now the main menu just looks a little bit bare. So let's make our play button a little bit bigger. You know, let's try 250 again. It's just instant trial and error. So 250, you know what? That looks a lot better. And you know what? Whilst we're polishing things off, I think these down here are a little bit too small. So let's try these with about 80. There we go, that looks a little bit better. One more quick audio edit. If you're using the correct font for this, so Caviar Dreams, keep the font size for these three labels at 70, any bigger, and the text will go off of the sides of the screen on an iPhone. And there we go really quick way of building up our main menu. So we have now made our main menu scene and I wanna test this out in our actual game. So I wanna hit run on the simulator and rather than being taken straight into our game scene, I wanna be taken into this scene because that's one of the main things a main menu scene should do. Should be the first scene that you go to. So let's set this up. What we will do, we will go to our game view controller dot swift. Now, as you may remember from all the way back in part one, the game view controller is controlling a view behind all of our scenes, which is displaying a scene to us. And if we ever change scene in our game, we just take the view that is showing us these scenes and we will make it present to us a different scene. So as you can see, we are starting off by presenting scene which is the game scene. But we don't want to move straight into our game scene, so we will find this line here and we will change it. Rather than saying let scene equals game scene, we will say let scene equals. Now there's two ways we can type this next line and this depends on if you have the bug in Xcode last time where the SKS file just wasn't being linked up to the code. I'll show you both lines of code, they're both really similar. So what we will do, we will say let scene equals sk scene, open bracket, file named, and here we will say our new sks file name. So main menu scene, and we're gonna force unwrap this here, which will say to our code, this is definitely gonna be here. 
Now this, just like I said last time, is one of those things where people tend to keep this as an optional because if our code can't find the main menu scene, doing this will make the game crash. But as I explained last time, I don't know if I'm looking at this in the wrong way, but I think there's a whole bunch of benefits to that because if we didn't unwrap this here and we kept it as an optional and worked with it as an optional, if it couldn't find our main menu, the game wouldn't crash, but it just wouldn't load a scene for us. And that, in my eyes, is worse than a crash. So doing this, if something goes horrendously wrong and for whatever reason, at that one point in time, our game can't find the main menu, it will crash rather than just not showing the main menu scene. But we know our main menu scene is gonna be there, so it's all good. Now, really, really, really important note, if you had the bug in Xcode where the SKS files weren't being linked up to the code in the previous part, rather than say an SK scene here, you will say main menu scene like this. If you didn't have the bug from last time, use SK scene here, okay? So we have now said to our code, as soon as we move into our game, take us into our main menu scene. So let's hit run and let's have a look. So now, as soon as we open our game, we are being taken into our main menu with our background, our logo, our game title, our play button and our how to play, which is being covered up just a little bit by our node count and our frames per second. But don't worry about that. We will hide our node count and our frames per second in just a few moments. So don't worry about that. So we now have our main menu. If any of your objects are slightly off the screen, remember that we lose the sides of the scene here on the iPhone. So move the object closer to the middle or make the object smaller or the font of the label a bit smaller or whatever. However, it doesn't do anything. We want to push the play button and get taken into our game scene. So let's make our main menu do something. So let's jump into our main menu scene.swift. So what do we want to do in our code for our main menu scene? Well, all we want to do in this code here is say if we push this label here, so our play button runs some code and that code will take us into our game scene. So this is just a label, but it will work as a button. And to do that, we will literally say when we touch the screen, when we're in the main menu scene, figure out where in the scene we have pushed. And if that point matches any point of this label here, run some code. So we will code all of that in our main menu scene.swift as this code here should be linked up to our SKS file. Now, as I mentioned a couple of times in the previous video, these SKS files can be just a little bit buggy. So the first thing we will do is make sure this code here is properly linked up to our SKS file. Now, I personally always do that when I'm working with an SKS file, because if down the line, something isn't working, you can run through a whole bunch of tests trying to fix your code when this problem here, where Xcode doesn't always link up the code to the SKS file is the problem. So by testing it now, it can sort of save a headache later on. So if this code here is successfully linked up to the SKS file, when we move into our main menu scene, the did move to view is gonna run. And here we will simply print the main menu code is linked up to the main menu SKS file. So now when we move into our main menu scene, this here should print. Let's just quickly test. It's only a really, really quick test and it can avoid so many problems later on. So here is the main menu scene and it is successfully printing for me and it should be printing for you too. If it is printing, everything's linked up. If it's not, then something isn't quite working and the code isn't linked up. If it's not printing for you, in the main menu scene, click on the scene, make 100% sure in the fourth tab along, you have the custom class set to the main menu scene. And in the view controller, if you are using the SK scene route, use the main menu scene route here, like so as the workaround. Once it's printing, you're all linked up and you are all ready to go. So now that's all done and we know our code is linked up to our SKS file, we can now make some code run to move us into the game scene when we push on our play label. So the first thing we have to do is link this label here up to our code. So click on the label, whether here or find the right one over here. Third tab along, the exact same as last time, we have to set this label's name property to play label push enter 
and save main menu scene dot swift. So as we're not just changing the text or changing something to do with this label's appearance, what we will do, we will globally declare an SK label node. And in a did move to view, we will link this all up. Then we can use it in the touches began. And we do this because otherwise we'd have to be re-linking up a variable or a constant every single time we tried to use it. So in the touches began. So every single time we touch the screen in the main menu and we don't need to do that. So we'll link it up once and just use a global variable for our label. So we can just link it up once and use it this way. So globally, we will say var. This will be a variable because we'll override how we set this up. Play label, which will start off being an empty SK label node. Then in the did move to view, we'll take our play label and set this to the object on the scene with the name property play label and say treat this as an SK label note. Now this name that you give the variable or the constant and what you use as the name property in the SKS file, it hasn't got to be the same. I like to use the same name for both. I think it makes it a lot more manageable. So we now have play label. This variable, which we can access anywhere within the main menu scene code, could we declare this globally in the scene. And this has been linked up to our play label from our SKS file, this here. So this here is linked up to play label. This was a variable because we had to override how we set this up as an SK label node. If this was a let, we wouldn't be able to change what this is set to, so we would get an error. So if we ever do this and link up something in our code to our SKS file in this way, when we declare it globally, we have to make it a var. So our label is now all linked up to play label. So all we have to do now is say, if we push it, then let's run some code. So for this, we need our touches began. So make sure you're outside of the did move to view. It should auto fill for you. And this code here is going to run whenever we tap on the screen. So all we want to do is say, if we push on the play label, run some code. Now to do this, we have a few different steps we have to go through here in the touches began. Because when the touches began runs, it's being passed touches, which is a set of information about the touch on the screen. So this is a set, a bit like an array, but has no order. So we will be passed in an unordered list of information about all the touches that just began on the screen. So before we can get any information about our touch, we have to loop round each of the touches in this set by saying for touch in touches the set from here open curly drop a line so when touches began now runs we are looping around this set that we're being passed so we can run some code on each touch in turn calling each touch touch so now each single touch on the screen will be this touch from here and we can get a whole bunch of information about this touch. But the only thing that we care about is where we touched on the scene. So we will say let, and we will call this point I touched, and this will equal touch, our uh, touch on the screen, this name from here, dot. And the thing that we care about is the location in the node, which is the scene. So we are saying take the touch on the screen, find out where we touched, on the scene and set this position. So set the X and the Y coordinates to point I touched. We can now use this to figure out if we tapped on the play label. So after this, still in the for loop, we will say if play label, our label, dot contains point I touched, then run the following code. So we're saying if that point that we touched on the screen matches the position of any part of our play label, run the code. So we are taking each touch on the screen, figuring out where we touched, and then saying if that position matches the position of any part of our label, then run the following code. And here we will have our code to change scene. So if we do touch the scene and the position that we touch matches any point of the play label, then run the following code. Now this will be the exact same code from over in our game over scene to move back into our game scene. So we will smash through this, but type it out regardless. Don't copy and paste it, especially if you're new to code, it's always good just to practice typing code whenever you can. So we have to begin by saying what scene we want to move to. So let scene to move to. We want to go to the game scene. 
which is built through our code. So we say game scene here. And as game scene doesn't have an SKS file, we have to say how big we want this scene to be. And the size of the game scene will be the same size as this scene. So all of our scenes have the exact same size. We have to set up our scale mode to make sure things aren't too stretched or too zoomed in by saying take the scale mode of the scene that we want to move to and set that to be the same as the scale mode of the current scene. We want a scene transition just to kind of polish it all off. So let scene transition equals SK transition. And we will use fade with duration across 0.5 seconds to make sure everything stays consistent. It would look really strange if you have different transitions across different parts of your game, unless you have a good reason for doing that. And all we have to do is take the view that is displaying our scenes. So self.view.presentScene scene to move to which is our game scene with our size and scale mode using scene transition which is our fade transition and that's it so to quickly review we took our play label from our sks file and linked it up to play label here in our code now as we didn't want to be re-linking this up every single time we touched the screen we declared it once globally linked it up in a did move to view so we could link it up once and use it later on in our scene so play label is now linked up to our label in our sks file this one and we did that by giving that label a name property which we used here in our code we then said, whenever we touch the screen, we want to figure out where we touched on the screen. So we took this set of touches that we are being passed into our touches began. We looped around this so we could affect each touch in turn, calling each touch, touch. We then said, take this touch, figure out where this touch happened in the scene and set this position to point I touched. We then said, if where we touched on the screen matches any part of the play label, run this code. And here we have the code to move to our game scene, which has been set up with a size and a scale mode using a fade transition. So now if we hit run and let's jump into our main menu, now, if we touch anywhere on the scene that isn't the play label, nothing is going to happen. But now when we tap on our play label, we will get taken into our game. So we now have a working main menu and we now almost have a complete game. Now, there's a few more things we have to do to polish off the entire project. But in terms of the game itself, there's only one thing we have left to do. And that is to take these labels right down here in the bottom corner of our game, which is showing our node count, so how many objects we have on the screen, and our frames per second. Don't ever trust the frames per second here in the simulator. On a device, we are running at 60 frames per second, which is the highest we can be at here on the iPhone. So don't trust the frames per second here in the simulator. Now this information down here is really, really good when it comes to making your game and testing it. But now our game's pretty much done. We have no need for these. And all we have to do before this game is completely finished is say we don't want these labels to be on display. To do this, jump into our game view controller dot swift, where we're dealing with our view presenting our scenes and we will find view dot show FPS show frame per second. That'd be false and view dot shows node count also false. So make sure these two are set to false. That will hide these labels. And now if we hit run, they won't be there. And we now have a fully working full iPhone game. We have our main menu and we can jump in. We can play, we can get game over. And we can restart the game. So we have now made a completed iPhone game. We have made the whole iPhone game seven sites. And we could call it a day there. We have made the whole game. We've worked our way through all of the code and the game is fully working. We have a main menu, we have a game over scene, we have high score, we have difficulty. We have everything that we need for this game. But this was a long series. And if you've made it this far, we might as well go all of the way with this and do well, everything. So what is left to do? Well, everything that we need to do is actually almost away from the actual game itself. Because here in the simulator, if we go to hardware here at the top and go to the home screen, at the moment, this is our game. 
This is our icon, and that's just a standard blank placeholder icon. Not really what we want. We want to use our own app icons. And app icons, they're really easy to take for granted when you're making a game, but they're so important. You know, the app icon is gonna be the thing on an iPhone main menu screen that shouts to the gamer, hey, come play me. Imagine all of the apps and all of the games on the gamer's phone. Your game needs to stand out. This icon should make them want to push your game and start the game. If it doesn't, gamers won't open your game and therefore they won't play the game. Therefore they don't see adverts, don't buy in-app purchases and that's money out of your pocket. At this stage, they have the game on their phone. They're so close to playing your game. Don't fall at the last hurdle with a lazy app icon, okay? The icon that we have for this game is pretty simple. It was only made so I could show you how we set up app icons here in this tutorial. But when it comes to making your own app icons for your own actual games, think very carefully about the design. It's very important. So for the app icon, it's actually really quick and really easy to set up. The challenge comes with actually making the app icon because not only has it got to look incredible, you need a lot of versions of it. So let's have a look how we would do this. Back into Xcode, we'll go back into our assets folder over here on the left. Here we have all of the balls in the game. We have the background, we have the logo, all of the sides from way back when. Now in here, we will find app icon. And here is where we set up our app icon. Now, if you've accidentally deleted this, you can re-add it by hitting add down here and you want icons and launch image and new iOS app icon. And we're gonna get this. And all of these squares need to have an icon in it. And each of these icons will be a different size. And we need to have all these different versions because there's so many different devices and so many different places that our icon is gonna be used. Now the first thing we have to do is make sure we have a space for all of the icons that we need. So click here in our app icon set and over on the right, third tab along, we'll make sure we have some for iPhone, iOS 7 and later and iPad, iOS 7 and later. So we should have a total of 17 spaces. So we now know we need a whole bunch of different icon sizes. But how do we know what size each icon has to be? Well, all the information is here by its space. So this first section here, these icons will be 20 by 20 at times two and times three. So we take this number here and times it by this here for the icon that will go in this space here. So this icon size here will be 40 by 40. This one here, we take the 20 and we times it by three to get an icon, which is 60 by 60 for this space here. Next one along to so next section, 29. So we take 29 by 29 at times two and at times three. So we do 29 times two for 58 by 58. And that's how big the icon size should be in here. And 29 times three for 87 by 87. And that's how big the icon should be in here and so on. So in the folder that you would have downloaded way back when with all of these images in, whether you've gone for the free set or the paid set, in addition to the images, you will have a folder for icons. And these have all been made in the correct sizes that we need. So you just have to work your way through all of those numbers, making all the icons in the correct size. Now to clarify, this icon wasn't made loads of times. That's madness. What I always do, or what I always get the graphics person working on my project to do for me, is we go for one big size, make a whole bunch of copies and scale down. Now, if you're making an icon for your game, always make the icon in a size of 1024 by 1024. So 1024 in width and 1024 in height. Because when you upload an app to the App Store through iTunes Connect, you have to provide an icon in that size. So make that your base, then get a whole bunch of copies and resize them down. And if you don't know how to resize images here on the Mac, if you was just to open up an image, here in preview, you would literally go to tools, adjust size and change the width and the height here. Okay, you need quite a few, but it is quite quick to do. So once you have an icon in a size of 1024 by 1024 and you have a whole bunch of copies, they're all in the right size. Literally all we do is drag from here straight into these squares. So let's work our way across. This will be 20 times two, so 40 by 40. Icon 20 by two drag it straight in, 20 by 20 times three, 29, 29 by two by three, 
and then just work your way down. So find this number here, 40, and this one here. 40 by 40 at times two, so 80 by 80. So 40 times two. Just like so. So simply work your way across, filling in each space. Once you're done, we hit run. And if you don't get any warning errors, so any yellow errors up here, then you know you've done them all right. If you got one wrong, it will give you a warning error saying that one of them is in the incorrect size. So once you've done that and we hit run, let's jump back to the home screen of the iPhone. And there we go, we now have an icon. So actually setting up the icon is as quick and as easy as that. Like I said, the challenge comes to actually making the icon and the time needed to make them in a whole bunch of sizes. So there we go, we now have our app icon and our game looks a lot better on the main menu of an iPhone. So with that done, we now only have one thing left to do and that is the launch screen, which is the loading screen when the game first loads up. Now at the moment, when the game first loads up, we only have a white screen. And we can see this by closing this game and reopening it here on the simulator. Now to do that, like on an actual device, we'd have to push the home button twice and swipe the app away. Now we haven't actually got a home button down here. So, as you can see, the shortcut for home is this, Shift, Command and H. So on your keyboard, hold Shift and Command, hit H twice. We will swipe our game away to close it. Might make it crash in Xcode, just because we closed the game and it weren't expecting us to. And now if we open the game, this white screen here, very quick, but very, very noticeable. We get a white screen before our game comes into play. We don't want that. That's a pretty bad first impression. And if the game is playing on quite an old device, that might take, I don't know, five, six, seven, maybe even eight or nine seconds before the game loads up. That's just a white screen. They might think the game's gone wrong, they might close it, straight away delete it. Again, you were so close to getting someone to play your game, so close to getting them to see an advert or whatever to make you money, and that one thing has cost you. So we don't want to have that white screen. Instead, we want to have an image. So, Back into that folder of assets. Again, either the free set or the paid set. The free set is just a placeholder image. And we will go into our launch screen folder. And we want our launch screen to look like this. Nice and simple, nothing fancy, but a million times better than that white screen. So we just have our background, we have our color wheel, the game name and game loading. So if that's on the screen for 10 seconds, it's not great that it's on the screen for 10 seconds, but it's very clear to the gamer what is happening. So we want to use this rather than our white screen. So we will drag this image, the launch screen.png, into our assets folder. So we have it in here. And what we're going to do is jump down here to our launch screen.storyboard. So for the launch screen, that loading screen, we have to venture a little bit outside of SpriteKit and into storyboards, which is mainly used for app development. Now we use storyboards way back in the Objective-C days here on Matt Heaney Apps. So this is a little bit of a throwback for the old school fans. So basically this here is our launch screen and we have to build it up. It's a bit like an SKS file, but we can use different things. So what we wanna do is get an image onto this because that image is gonna be the entire launch screen. We could build it up here, but we want one image, nice and simple. So down here in the bottom right hand corner, third tab along, we want to find an image view. Search for it, if you can't find it, it will be there. An image view, here we go. This will display a single image or an animation. Perfect, let's drag it on. And we want this image to cover the entire screen. So drag the edges right up to the edges of the screen. Use your blue lines, make sure it's right up to the edge. There we go. So all we have to do is give this an image. So click on the UI image view. Over here on the right, fourth tab along, image is gonna be launch screen, like this. Now, that is what we said we wanted, but it doesn't work just yet. We actually have two big problems. Because to start with, we're actually only working on one screen size here. 
This won't resize anything for us. And as you can see right down here at the bottom, we're working with an iPhone 7, so a 4.7 inch screen. If we click on that and change this to say an iPad, we're gonna have to zoom out. Our image stays in the size of the iPhone 7. This outline here is the screen, but that's our launch screen. That's not great. Again, with an older device. So say the four inch screen on the iPhone SE or the iPhone 5. Now, because the image is made for the iPhone 7, it's way too big. So that's not what we really wanna do. So let's jump back onto the iPhone 7, the 4.7 inch screen. And we have to look into a part of something called auto layout, where we will use constraints to change how big this image is, depending on how big the screen is. Now, auto layout and constraints is a huge, huge area. So we will only go into what we need for this. So what we would do, we need to make 100% sure whatever device we're currently looking at, that the top of the image is right up at the very top of the view, the right of the image is right to the right of the view. The bottom is right at the bottom of the view and the left is tucked right into the left. And what we will do is we will take this image and say, whatever device we're on, make sure the top of this image is right at the very top of the view. Make sure the right of this image is right at the very right of the view. Make sure the left is right at the very left of the view and the bottom is right at the very bottom of the view. So it will change this image size for us. So making sure we have clicked here on the image, we will come down here to this icon down here for our constraints. It's like a square with a few little bits sticking out the side. Click on that and we go to our add new constraints. We will click this here, this here, this here, and this here. This will say to our image, make the top of the image be zero points from the top of the view. Make the left of the image zero points to the left of the view. Make the right of the image zero points to the right of the view and make the bottom of the image zero points to the bottom of the view. Now, very important to remember to hit add four constraints. So what we've now done, we have locked the top of the image to the top of the screen, the right of the image to the right of the screen, bottom of the image to the bottom of the screen, left of the image to the left of the screen. So now if he was to change device, whichever device we go to, the image will change its size to be the correct size. So that's all well and good, but it still looks really, really squished. And that is because as our game is universal, this image has been made in the aspect ratio of an iPad. So as you can see on an iPad, the image looks as it should, but on an iPhone is being squished in. So what we have to do is say resize this image but keep it in the correct aspect ratio. So that will mean we will lose some of the sides if we run this on an iPhone. But that's fine, we have worked with that. There's nothing here down the edges that we're gonna miss. To do that, click on the image. Over here on the right, fourth tab along, we will go to view, content mode, and rather than scale to fit, we will go to aspect fill. This now will resize the image, but keep it in the right aspect ratio so it doesn't look squished. So on an iPhone, we will lose the sides of the image, but the image won't look squished. On an iPad, we get the entire picture. On an iPhone, we get the center part of the picture. And any device we're on, this image will now change size to fit the entire screen, but without making the image squished on an iPhone because the image was made for an iPad aspect ratio because the game is universal. And with that, we now have our launch screen. So hit run. And we did see it very quickly in there. But let's take a proper look. Let's close it. And now when we open our game, we're gonna get our loading screen again very, very quick. Sometimes it can take longer than others, but rather than having that white screen, we now have our loading screen. And on older devices, where that screen is there for just a little bit longer, that is gonna make such a big difference and have such a big impact on the gamer, okay? And now we have a completed project. And I am starting to think that I forgot to use the custom font Caviar Dreams on these three labels down here. And that is why they look different. Let's have a quick check. Let's jump back into our main menu scene.sks. And apparently I didn't use the custom font. That was 
bugging me for so long why they weren't looking right. I will put it in as an audio edit previously in the video to make sure you guys do it way back when, back when we are setting up the main menu. But if you haven't used Caviar Dreams on these three labels down here, select them all or each at a turn, click on the T and let's use Caviar Dreams. And I'm also gonna make these labels a little bit smaller because the letters in this custom font are a little bit bigger. So 70, and there we go. Oh, that's bugging me for so long. I didn't record it, but I was looking at this for about an hour, thinking I was missing something from this main menu. So now that I've got that taken care of, let's hit run and let's have a look. And there we go. So we now have a completed game and a completed project. <laughs> and I now have the right font. I was so, so close to going an entire series without making a silly mistake. And one got me right at the end. So anyway, there we go. Complete a game, complete a project. However, this video is not quite done. So we now have a completed game and a completed project. It's completely playable. We have our icon, we have our launch screen. And this game that we have made would be App Store ready. So what is left to do in this video? Well, I want to do one more section to wrap up this video and wrap up this series. And this will be a little bit different because this will hopefully be pretty quick, but I won't be showing you much actual code. What I will do is I will now go through this project and make some suggestions around what you could pretty easily change, which will really make this game your own. And if you make some changes, you'll be doing everything you can be to try and make your version of this game stand out as much as possible. So why am I doing this? Well, I'll be upfront and completely honest with you at time of recording and at time of release, there's a very, very strong chance that this will be my last ever tutorial here on YouTube teaching code. The amount of work that has to go into these videos compared to the revenue is just not a feasible thing to be doing anymore. It is what it is, but there's a strong chance this will be my last video. If anyone's been around since the beginning, this channel has been around for about three or four years now, if not a little bit more. And the backbone of this channel has always been full game tutorial series. I did a lot in the past using Objective-C, which I took down because they were very out of date. And now I think this is my third here in Swift using SpriteKit. So I've done a lot of these tutorials and I've seen a lot of people take the projects and release them on the App Store. Some better than others. Sometimes people take the game as it is, completely keep it as it is and release it, which was obviously always going to happen. Other people take these games as a platform, they change them and try and get somewhere with these games. And that, I think, from all of my years of doing these tutorials, we must have broken double figures for full game tutorial series. Over all of them, seeing them be released over and over again on the App Store by different people, the difference between a project flopping and a project that has a better chance at doing well is making changes. These games that I teach you in these series, they are designed to teach you how to make the game and use them as a platform to go and make your own game. The games that I'm teaching you how to make, they're never going to be enough to be a standalone success on the App Store. Never. If you've made this game and you want to do something with it, you have to make changes. Always remember to be thinking about the changes because the somewhat obvious truth is if the person making the tutorial series or the article or the whatever, if they think there's a 0.0001% chance the game they have made stands a chance of being a massive hit and making a whole bunch of money, they're not going to give the code away, okay? Games that people teach you how to make were never designed to make a whole bunch of money. They are designed to teach you how to code. And if you want to do something with it, you have to use it as a platform and build upon it. Okay, so what are some of these changes? Well, let's start with the obvious one and one that a few people don't tend to do and is frustrating to see when it happens. If you're gonna release this game as it is or with any changes, change the name. Don't call it Seven Sides. That is the smallest and possibly one of the most important changes you can make. If you keep this being called Seven Sides, you're shooting yourself in the foot massively. If you took this on as a career, at some point or another, you will have a portfolio with all of the games that you've made. Whether you're gonna show that to someone who's looking for a freelancer, to someone that's gonna pay you to make a game, or if you're going for a job, the first thing that they will do when they look at your games is Google the game. 
And if they see a game that you're claiming is fully your own, is like an exact clone of something made in a free to view tutorial, they're gonna laugh you out of the room. And I'm not saying that to be mean, I'm saying that because that's obvious. If you want someone to pay you thousands, if not tens of thousands of pounds to make a game for them, they're gonna do their research. And if they find it, that obviously, they're gonna take your portfolio and just throw it away. And as obvious as that is, people have done it. There's a solo mission on the App Store. Someone's taken the exact game that we made on this channel, added a few features, put it on the App Store and said it's fully their work. And they've just, they've just cursed that game for themselves. They can't show that work off. And what's the purpose? Getting a few more downloads from the exposure from the series? These videos don't even get many views. It's not worth it. So change the name. The other thing is to change, obviously, the overall look. Not even just the graphics. Have a play around with the user interface. Change the main menu. You know, there is an endless number of possibilities of the way that this game could be laid out. So be creative with it and just go absolute nuts with it. One of the big things with the overall look is obviously the color wheel itself. This is almost the centerpiece of our game. It is the big one. And one of the things you could do is just change the order. I remember I showed you it way back when, but in our models and data file, we have our list. Just really, really small changes. And the way we set this code up, because the random ball colors are being pulled from this list, any change you make, the game will just work with it. So very minor changes, but that looks completely different. And because the random colored balls are being picked from that list, like I said, the game will just work. I have my volume turned right down, so you probably can't hear the sound effects. But like with sound effects, mix the sound effects up. It can make a huge difference. That's a difference. And why stop there? This color wheel is such an important part of the game. There's more you can do to it. And the big thing with this is that most changes you make, because of the way that we have set this code up, most changes to the color wheel, like the order or the colors or the whatever, the game will work with it. So one of the big ones is changing the size of the color wheel. I will show you this code as a quick example of how simple some of the code can be if you think around how it can work. So in our prep color wheel function, after our loop to make the color wheel, if we took the color wheel base and we changed the scale to say 0. let's go extreme, 0.5, Obviously you wouldn't do it this extreme, but that will have a massive impact on how this game looks. Okay, so again, you make the ball a lot smaller, but why not make the color all start this small and then get bigger and bigger and bigger? And in fact, the actual version of this on the app store that I've got, I mixed it up a little bit and it's at 0.9. Tiny changes just to make it feel different. You know, it looks different. We're not, we're not overlapping the edge anymore. One of the other big things that you could change is the gameplay. You have all the code in place for it. Why couldn't we do when the ball hits the side, make that side appear to be a new random color or delete the side and then you have to delete the color wheel and a new one's gonna spawn. Anything with the code that we have, if you think, and even if you're new to coding, if you just look at the code and think about it and a little bit of research here or there, you can make massive differences. That's what I'm trying to get across. Massive, massive differences. Don't be just limited to what I've taught you. Push it as far out as you can. So change that gameplay. And the last one that I'm gonna say about is features. Add features to this. This is obviously the bones of a game. Add features, do a bit of research and throw a game center leaderboard onto it. it can make such a massive difference. Throw achievements onto it. Add back in music. We did that in Solo Mission. Go look at other series and learn new skills and merge them all together to take a platform and just build it up and up and up. Add adverts and try and make some money and use adverts in a creative way. Don't just make them pop up and annoy the gamer. Give them something for watching the advert, you know? Be creative with your adverts. Because if you're watching this looking to make your own games on the App Store, you've got to be getting a lot of advert views to be making decent money. I'm not saying that to try and put you off. I'm saying that because it's the truth, but it's still so very, very doable. So when you're adding features, just get some adverts in there. At time of recording, I would personally recommend using Ad Colony for reward adverts, Google Ad Mobs for banners and for the one between the games because they're very, very, very short. But there's a whole bunch of other platforms out there. And there's so many videos here on YouTube that show you how to do this stuff. Google Ad Mobs, for example, go look at Geeky Lemon's channel. They have a great tutorial on it. All of the features you need are here to view for free on YouTube. 
Okay, so you can do it, you can do it. So by changing the name, the look, whether that's through graphics or with the layout, have a play around with the color wheel, change the structure in terms of size, mix up that gameplay and add some features and you can turn this into a decent little game. But just taking it and submitting it as it is, isn't the way to be going about doing this, okay? Trust me, I've done enough of these tutorials and I've seen them be submitted by random people claiming the original game is fully their own enough times and it doesn't get them anywhere. I'm gonna quickly change this back because if someone jumps in at the last moment to see what we made, it's gonna look different to what we actually did make. Uh, I'll keep the scale in there and I'll take it back to this. So that's with the 0.9 scale that I showed you about two minutes ago. And with that, we are now all done. We have now made a complete iPhone game. We have app icons, we have a launch screen, and we've taken a look at some of the ways that you can change this game to really make it your own. So there we go. We are now job done with another series. You have now made a complete, 100% finished iPhone game. So thank you for watching this entire series. I really hope you enjoyed it. I really hope you found it useful. Uh, this series was supposed to be quite short and quite a quick series. That did not go to plan. Um, but I really hope you enjoyed working your way through making this game with me. As I said in the video, there's a pretty strong chance that this will be my last coding tutorial here on YouTube. And if that is the case, thank you for watching any of my videos here on the channel. Thank you for supporting the channel in any way that you have. And I genuinely hope that you found the videos useful. So possibly for the last time, thank you for watching this video. Thank you for watching the entire series. Leave any questions or any feedback down in the comments. Hit like and thank you once again for watching. Goodbye.